Alrighty, everyone, good afternoon. Now, I was out at the bars last night. I know you have a little bit more spunk in you than that. Good afternoon, everybody. There we go. This is the last afternoon session of the day. And as uh, the great Jay-Z once said, you could have been anywhere in the world tonight, but you're here with me, and I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> go ahead, break the ice. Um, my name is Mandela Schumacher Hodge. I'm an educator, entrepreneur, and startup advisor. I was in the 2008 Los Angeles Corps, where my LA folks, where you at? All right, apparently not all of them are here, that's okay. <laughs> um, I was an ed tech entrepreneur. I was also the global director of Startup Weekend Education. It's the larging starting point for it's the largest starting point for entrepreneurs who are building education innovations. I am also the founder of the Startup House. It's a new online blog that basically helps entrepreneurs share their authentic stories and build community as they go on their entrepreneurial journey. In addition to that, I am also the founding Portfolio Services Director at Cape 4 Capital. It's a seed stage social impact venture firm based in Oakland, California. Where's my Bay Area folks at? And that's what I'm talking about. Um, in a nutshell, you can think of me as a professional that helps entrepreneurs succeed, both in business and in life. I am absolutely thrilled when Naya asked me to uh, host this session because I had the great opportunity to spotlight some people I love most in this world, entrepreneurs who are pushing the envelope, challenging the status quo, and creating new innovations that will change the lives of students, educators, and school systems around the country, and also, as you'll hear today, around the globe. Before we get into their exciting demonstrations, I actually want to level set with everyone just for a couple of minutes and take you on a journey of how Teach for America actually became an organization that understood the importance of leveraging entrepreneurship to be a catalyst for um, educational equity. As everyone knows, this is the 25th anniversary of Teach for America. This is why we've all descended upon the capital of the U.S. of A. Um, but what you don't know, perhaps, is that beyond teaching in the classroom, Teach for America actually offers a plethora of pathways that alumni and core members can enter as other ways to make an impact. You can see beyond teacher leadership, it goes and extends into school leadership, school systems, even different sectors like law, business, and health. The one we're going to focus on today in this session is the one you see on the right of this diagram called Social Entrepreneurship and Innovation. Now, before this became an official entity, an organization with a fantastic team that I've had great fortunes of working with the past couple years, it actually was prompted by some core members and alumni who just had the entrepreneurial spirit within them, had the guts to go out there and do things differently. Perhaps you know the founding members of the CHIP organization, Michelle Rhee, of course. We have uh, Economy of One with Alec Ross, who's also worked under Hillary Clinton. And then, of course, Sarah, who founded New Schools for New Orleans. Again, these people were the original entrepreneurs for Teach for America. And today, you're going to meet eight others. This team, Social Entrepreneurship and Innovation, we call it SEI, was founded just seven years ago. And in that very, very short time, again, I want to say seven years ago, it has already impacted and has in its pipeline over 800 entrepreneurs affecting schools, nonprofits, ed tech ventures, you name it. Some of these you may recognize. Does anyone see a name up here? They recognize or they utilize in their school? There we go, yeah. A lot. So again, alumni supporting other core members in the classroom has been a big theme of Teach for America for years. The community that make up the social entrepreneurship and innovation team is also comprised of diverse people. About two-fifths of the members identify as people of color, and over half of the membership are women. Over the past seven years, it has grown immensely. Um, just last year, they hosted the second annual Entrepreneurs United Summit at the Kauffman Foundations in Kansas City. And in just one year, they increased that attendance by 40%. They've also be get, been giving social innovation awards for several years that amount to over $600,000 to over 17 different alumni across the country. 
Um, of course, I'm sure you've all seen our uh, alumni featured in Forbes 30 Under 30. There's been 29 to date, echoing green, 10 fellows, and several prominent accelerators such as Imagine K-12 and Y Combinator. And let's not forget all the fellowships like the Aspen Institute, the Mind Trust, et cetera. Our entrepreneurs are making a massive difference, and today is your opportunity to meet some of them. So if you're wondering if you're in the right place, here's how you're going to find out. I hope that by the end of this session, you walk out of here with four things clearly understood. Number one, entrepreneurship is an option for you. Number two, TFA has a program that wants to help you bring any idea you have to life. Your fellow core members, several of who you will meet today, have already created solutions that may be what you need in your classroom, your school system. And finally, there are going to be a plethora of opportunities for you to collaborate with these entrepreneurs to ensure that your problems get solved. Because again, this is a team effort. So, to begin and kick us off with this wonderful event, I'm actually going to bring up a longtime friend of mine, Dan Carroll. He's the co-founder and chief product officer at Clever. And if no one knows what Clever is, I don't know if you've been living under a rock or not, but today you're going to learn. Um, Clever is basically, excuse me, it helps schools utilize educational apps very simply with a one-click login process for all teachers and students. They're less than four years old, but already are impacting over 20 million students. They are in 50,000 schools. That's over one in every three schools. So as you can see, this is just the beginning. And today we're going to have the opportunity to hear the co-founder, Dan, who I actually met at a startup weekend where he came up with the idea. So it's been really cool for me to see his journey. But he's going to share it. And then he's also bringing up a special guest, Jin Su, who's had so much experience both integrating tech as a classroom teacher, as well as a uh, personalized learning manager at Aspire, and even before that, at Kit Chicago. So if you guys could give a big round of applause, we're going to start off with Dan. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. It is such an honor to be here um, uh, and sharing a little bit about my story and Clever's story because I remember so clearly uh, being at the summit five years ago and being uh, sitting in maybe these exact seats um, watching other entrepreneurs share their stories and, and share their ideas as part of the five year ago Shark, Shark Tank. So it's, it's, a, it's a amazing to be back here in DC. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, Clever's uh, founding story and how, how we came to reach this pretty amazing scale that I still kind of blows my mind every day. We've raised $40 million, we have a team of 100 people, and we're working with uh, 81 of the top 100 school districts across the country and many of the most innovative uh, schools in the country like Jinsu. But it didn't start there. And the way Clever got started is it started with a problem. Um, and it started with frustration. And then when I talk to other entrepreneurs, that's a really common theme. Um, people start companies not because they want to be a billionaire or not because they you know, watched the social network and got it, it, it excited about that. They start companies because they're frustrated, because there's, they want to accomplish something and there's no other way of getting it done. And that's definitely the way that Clever was born. So if I rewind back five years and think about myself in 2011, uh, I was a classroom teacher. I was a core member. I was teaching eighth grade science in Denver at an amazing uh, charter network, uh, Strive Prep. And in my classroom, I was frustrated. Um, I had finally gotten a handle on, on teaching. I'd finally gotten a handle on classroom management. But what I realized once I kind of got my classroom in order is that even if my students were paying attention to me, they weren't learning, or they weren't all learning. Um, and the reason they weren't all learning was incredibly frustrating. They were so different. They were diverse. How many people in here are currently in the classroom? That's incredible. You're doing amazing work. And I hope this resonates. I hope you noticed the same. I'm sure you've noticed the same thing that I did. My students had different reading levels. They had different interests. They were coming from different backgrounds. And the tools that I had to help them learn, those weren't personalized tools. They were one size fits all. I could give one lecture or assign one homework. Maybe I could work really hard, plan two or three, you know, do two or three X planning and differentiate a little bit. But the, what I wanted was to give every student the personalized education he or she needed, not a one-size-fits-all solution that most of the time didn't even uh, match what they were looking for. So I was frustrated in my classroom. I wanted to personalize instruction. And 
my background's in technology, so I started to look at technical tools. If I can let every student you know, use great software, they can learn at their own pace, they can have more choice, they can have more autonomy, I can personalize my classroom. The teachers in the room, I'd love to you know, talk to you after about if you've tried to do that in your classroom. Um, so I, I was frustrated, I thought I found an answer, um, but as I tried to roll that out, I became frustrated again. Um, I found that the, when I was using technology in my classroom, my hope is that it was going to give me superpowers. It would let me um, work more one-on-one -on -one with my students and you know, really give me, uh, empower me as a teacher. But instead what I found is that technology often slowed me down. I was spending all my time in the classroom resetting passwords, creating accounts, doing IT things and not teaching. Has anyone in the room had, had that experience? Of yeah, <laughs> it's a common one. And so that frustration um, led me right after the, the summit uh, five years ago to leave the classroom and become the director of technology. I said, if I can control the budget, if I can control the system, maybe I can create, uh, give the teachers the tools that they need to personalize their learning, but do it in a way that empowers them instead of forces them to become uh, IT administrators inside their classroom. Um, and so there again, you know, the frustration led me out of the classroom, led me to a new role, um, and I started to pull on that thread. And as I, and I, as the director of technology, I thought, I want to try 40 to, to pilot 40 tools uh, in my first year. I want to. You know, I know the teachers have so many needs, they're telling me all the things that they'd like, better math games and better communication tools. If I can try out lots of things, we'll figure out what works and we'll really get teachers to the right, the right tools that they want. Um, in my first year, I hoped to f pilot 40 different uh, tools. I tried four, and those four, as a, as a director of technology, nearly killed me. I was up all night um, shuffling uh, CSV files around, doing crazy things to try to make sure that when the teachers l took out the laptop cards or took out the iPads, things were actually going to work. And Jinsu will tell you a little bit more about that experience because that's the world he lives in uh, today uh, uh, in just a few minutes. And so that, that just led to a new frustration. I said, how can we actually innovate at scale? How can we reduce the, the barriers and reduce the risks and make it easy for teachers to use technology in the classroom? Um, and that led me to kind of tap into the TFA network. I visited other uh, great uh, charter networks. I visited Rocketship and Summit and Aspire. And I said, how are these folks who I'm reading about and hearing about all the innovation they're doing, how are they making this work? And it turned out that they didn't have some sil silver bullet. They actually had the exact same problem I had, except they had it at an even bigger scale. They were working with more students and teachers, trying to manage more applications. And that's when I realized that my frustration, you know, I needed to take, a, take another step to try to scratch that itch and to find the answers to, my, uh, to the answers of the problems that I was feeling. And so I was sharing my, my frustrations with two of my best friends from college and attended a great startup weekend with Mandela and a lot of other great entrepreneurs and decided that it was time to leave the classroom and start Clever, to start a sol to build a solution that could make it so that when you wanted to try something new in your school or in your, in your district or in your network, you could click a couple buttons and that application would be ready to go in classrooms and teachers and students would have an easy way of logging in so that they could, everyone can focus on the learning and not focus on just getting things set up. And so uh, when we started at Clever, it was, it was three of us. Uh, we were in a, a house. Uh, we were working around the clock. I was calling everyone I'd ever met at places like the summit or uh, you know, e sending random emails to random people in the TFA directory. And the thing that helped us get off the ground that took us from having nothing other than a small prototype working at, at the schools where I was tech director to getting some initial traction was this passion about this problem. Because I've been so frustrated and thought about this for so long I, th that passion and the understanding I had resonated with the people I talked to. People made bets on Clever that, to be quite honest, they probably shouldn't have made. We were three people without a, that, that much experience and without a real product, and schools were trusting us to solve some of their stickiest technical challenges. And they did it because they could tell that we, we, were, we were passionate and we were focused. So uh, from the, that start in the summer of 2012, and the kind of passion and focus on the problem, Clever's been able to scale in a pretty amazing way. Um, we have raised money, we've built out a team, we've worked with, you know, gone from working with, you know, single schools to some of the biggest districts in the country like Los Angeles. Um, and along the way, I think the thing that's, that's, that stayed consistent that we've really held on to is that passion for solving problems. It's not about what the company be can become, it's about finding the ways to allow teachers to innovate and use software in their classroom and to focus on learning and not have to worry uh, ab about technology getting in the way instead of having technology be a superpower. So. I'd love to um, actually, uh, instead of just talking about the Clever story, bring Jinsu up on stage and talk a little bit about what it's like from his perspective as a personalized learning manager at Alpha Public Schools to use Clever in the classroom, the things that he's uh, able to do. So let's give a round of applause for Jinsu. Hi. 
Hey, Jim, so, uh, hey. so to start us off, can you talk a little bit about Alpha? Uh, why yeah. are you using technology in the classroom, and what's the kind of the per mission of the school? Yeah, so Alpha Public Schools, uh, it's three schools, two middle schools and high schools serving a high needs area in San Jose. Uh, we're about 93% free and reduced meals, um, predominantly Hispanic, although we have a high like Vietnamese population as well. Um, the mission of Alpha uh, actually kind of sprang up from a lot of concerned parents looking around. At the time, KIPP was in the neighborhood, and, that's, and KIPP was killing it there as well. I'm a former KIPPster, so I KIPP. Um, and, but what they were noticing was that there's only one real good middle school option in San Jose in the area, and so they were looking for an innovative option. Um, and so Rocket, or some parents from Rocket KIPP, some parents from other schools came together and um, asked for Alpha to be created. It's now in its fourth year, um, and so Alpha is really focused on relationships, strong academics, um, making sure students can succeed, um, but they brought in personalized learning as well. Um, and personalized learning for us, what that means is using technology in order to make sure that we can create an individualized pathway for each student. We're not there yet, I fully acknowledge that, um, but trying to make sure that we're meeting each of the students' needs, like we talked about that earlier. Um, like, I mean, I was a math teacher and I would sometimes feel like I was like beating my head against the wall because I was teaching sixth grade math to kids who didn't know how to add necessarily. And like trying to figure out how do we make sure we can catch those kids up, and at the same time making sure that our highest kids were also still learning every day and weren't getting bored so we can really tap into that potential. Great. Yeah. And talk to me a little bit about what the ideal model looks like. What kind of software and tools uh, yeah. are happening in that ideal personalized model? And what are some of the barriers that have kept you from getting there? Yeah, so um, there are some really, really, really cool schools across the country. Um, it's not just in the Bay Area, Mark. Like, you used to have to just go to the Bay Area, visit Summit, Rocket Ship, um, CICS, West Belden, and Chicago's kicking butt, Denver, uh, Bruce Elementary, like, blew my mind. There's a lot of places that are doing some really, really cool things. Um, couple of things that you actually need to make this happen. One is I think that for a long time technology has been under the domain of the IT director and so it wasn't viewed as part of the curriculum and now we're starting to see it getting intertwined together. So I think that first that shift needs to happen and I think it's slowly happening and the most innovative schools get that. Um, one of my friends who's in a similar position to me said it's kind of funny that there's like a math department, an English department and then like a tech person, so like there's a math chair and then it's like we don't teach tech, it's integrated throughout. So like, how do we like, get to that point where it's just assumed that it's part of like, living in there? Um, I think another hard part which is like just teacher preparation. Um, this is a pretty radical shift for a lot of teachers. We've had a lot of teachers come into our schools. Um, so I took to Chicago and I know this was frustration at other networks as well where um, they've worked in a very, very like Ivy Weedy Weedy, very rigid environment where the teacher has control and moving to a student-centered classroom is really hard. And I, I remember when I first did it, I was like, I love being the page on stage, so it was a really, really, really hard transition to make. Um, but tools-wise, I mean, I think we're looking for tools that are adaptive, that actually are able to meet every single student we know and diagnose their level, and then give them content at that level, and then also talk to the other programs. I think that's the ideal one, so that like, if you master something on Khan Academy, ST Math knows that and can like ship that for them as well. Or like, also in an ideal world, know like, this is like ST Math is probably best for this kid, Khan Academy is probably best for this kid, and this specific skill. Um, and then also be able to give us data to really act on it, right? Like, um, as a teacher, like, you get inundated with all kinds of data, like, exit tickets, assessments, even if you don't have technology in the classroom, how do you make it so that you get this, um, all this information and then act on it? So I think in an ideal world, you're able to act on it because the secret sauce is the teacher is no longer necessarily imparting their wisdom. They might have seen it on a video. The teacher, what they're actually doing is facilitating deep discussions and meeting them at their level. So I think how do you get the secret to, like their real secret sauce is their like ability to tap into students' creativity, discussion, have math talks, which are like the best, um, like actually be able to do that. And uh, tell me a little bit about how Clever felt as you you know build towards yeah. this personalized model. What is how does Clever fit in? Yeah, so um, it's funny. I remember I was one of the people who did not bet on Dan early on because I remember he came earlier. Like uh, we met at a conference in New Orleans and he asked to stay on my bed. I was like. We're trying to solve an impossible problem. Your couch. Your too. couch. Your couch. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Over there. <laughs> your couch. Uh, but uh, so I remember it was um, a major issue, and I think that Dan exactly the same exact issue. CSVs, like I mean, like trying to make rosters was really, really hard. And I know it sounds like such an unsexy problem, but it's the worst. Um, like every tech director from like five, ten years ago will tell you it's. I mean, like it's not exaggerating when he's saying like we were up every night. And then, like, you know, you have systems, students come in and out, so you have to make new accounts. If you, have, if you don't delete the accounts, then you might be overpaying for things. Like, it's just a mess that you have to keep those records. Um, you have to be a little bit anal retentive in order to do it, and I'm a little bit free feeling, so that didn't work out too well. Um, but for Clever, I think what it, it, what it solved, um, and I can't, I mean, 
keep in mind, I only have about a thousand students at both Tip Chicago and at Alpha. Um, like I have a friend here who uses uh, Clever as well, Josh Shaw. He's also a 2009 Baltimore Corps member. He works at Baltimore City Schools and their tech department and has 80,000 students. So I can't even begin to process that amount of work. Um, so what Clever solves is that it syncs with your SIS, so like Illuminate or PowerSchool, basically where your rosters live, and makes the accounts automatically. So like every night, or in some cases, it depends on each of the programs, it's about an hour or every night, it syncs and you set an algorithm like, I want it to be first name, last name at alphapublicschools.org, and it makes it. Um, so you, instead of me spending hours on end, like my job as personal learning manager in an ideal world is to make sure I'm coaching teachers to use technology well, thinking about the model, where are their weaknesses on there. Um, we do have some programs that don't use Clever, they're not Cleverized yet, so like I do spend some time on rosters, but a lot of my time has been taken away um, because of Clever and I've saved up so I can actually coach teachers, do the job that I, like, that I really care about, and we'll make the model to do. Yeah. And one of the things I love most about uh, uh, being at Clever is the way that I get to work with great entrepreneurs, um, uh, many of them who are TFA alums, and also great school leaders like you, and build this really easily collaborative relationship. What's that been like on your end? What's it been like collaborating with Clever, yeah. um, working together? So, I mean, I think, one, there's a really great ecosystem in TFA with Entrepreneurship United. I would say there's, um, like, Jan's a good friend. I think there's a lot of, like, similar people in my position that have grown um, from TFA, so I'll call them up. There's, a, like, a good cohort there. Um, in addition to that, I think that Clever, one thing that I respect about Clever a lot is that they have these core values that like, are very similar to our classroom core values, like never stop learning, do the extra credit, so like they're always going above and beyond. Um, and I'll wrap this up because I'm on my uh, schedule. Uh, but, um, so I think like one, they're always trying to find new ways to help teachers in schools. Like they sent a representative out to Baltimore to work with my friend Josh to see like what are the main pain points. They call us all the time and actually come to our schools just to kind of watch us and be like, walk through that process and be like, that sucks, we'll fix that for you. Um, and that's been really cool. And I know there's a few secret projects that um, we've been able to partner with. Um, and hopefully there'll be uh, features that are spread out to everyone. And I'm gonna say one last thing about Clever is um, they have an innovative pricing model, and it sounds like I'm pitching, but it's free. And I think for schools, that was the biggest thing. It's, it's a free program for schools. They charge the companies to work with them. So for schools, I mean, it was, it was a no-brainer for us. Like, we know how tight budgets are, so we're like, so. Awesome, thank you so much, Mr. All right, round of applause for Dan. Again, I really wanted Dan and Jin Su both to be up here because what we're trying to open everyone's minds to while we have this opportunity at the 25th anniversary summit is the opportunity to collaborate and be more intentional about co uh, connecting these innovators with these entrepreneurs, excuse me, with these educators that are in the classroom. And so um, now we're going to segue into the very, very first presentation and how this is going to work just to make sure everyone's on the same page is we have seven phenomenal, oops, am I pushing something? That's okay. <laughs> we have seven phenomenal um, entrepreneurs standing off to the side ready to present. Each one is going to be about five minutes long and that's number one, to get their point across to you very quickly and to keep your attention and engage throughout it. I don't know about you guys, but um, being up here in front of a room full of your peers and some partners and people from the community can be a little bit intimidating sometimes. So what I'm going to ask of you as audience members, if when people come up here to present, if you can just give them a roaring round of applause, your energy is really going to make this event special. And I think give them an extra boost of confidence they may need. Not saying they need it, because as you will see, they are phenomenal. Um, but first up, we have Michelle Brown of Tom and Lit. If you guys can get a huge round of applause, that'd be awesome. Thank you, guys. Can everyone hear me? All right. I am Michelle Brown, the founder of Tom and Lit. Tom and Lit is a free online platform, free, for middle and high school reading teachers. And so before I show you what it is, um, my journey as a social entrepreneur really started in the classroom. Specifically, uh, Common Lit was born out of my own frustration at the sheer number of hours that I spent scrambling to find decent free materials on the internet and uh, then adapting those materials. This was a huge part of my reality as a teacher in a high poverty school. And it turns out it's not just my reality. The average teacher spends roughly 300 hours every year searching and adapting materials, uh, searching for and adapting materials for class. 
think about the impact we could have as a system if instead we were investing those hours in building relationships with families um, and students. So what I experienced firsthand in the classroom is a market failure in which teachers in the lowest performing schools also have the fewest instructional resource. Uh, inequitable access to materials will lead to inequitable outcomes. And the bottom line is that teachers without good materials will never reach their full potential. Common solves this problem for middle and high school teachers. Our platform is simple but transformative for classroom practice. Teachers simply go to commonlit.org and they choose a theme, they choose a discussion question, they choose a grade level, they choose a text, and they can access a free online collection of news articles, short stories, poems, historical documents, and more, all prepared by master reading teachers. So our platform is flexibly designed so that you can print and distribute them, you can use them on laptops or on other one-to-one -one devices. So our vision was really to create a digital library that has stories that actually reflect the diverse experiences of the students that we serve. We thought that it was really important that students were able to see themselves in what they're reading in reading class. And so to do this, we partnered with over 35 individual authors and copyright holders who license materials to our digital collection. So one of the best things we did early on is we piloted our resource in real classrooms. And this was great for us because we were instantly plugged in to an enthusiastic network of early adopters. Um, and we also were able to get some early credibility with experts in the field. So where we are now is we launched uh, the free website in January of 2015. And in January of this year, we're reaching roughly 30,000 teachers per month. We think that this is only the beginning. Our users are primarily based here in the US, but we're also seeing a growing number of users in classrooms all over the world, which is really exciting. Winning the TFA Social Innovation Award put us on a really incredible track. Today, we are a mission-driven team of teachers and software developers, and we're based here at the Global Tech Incubator 1776 with other tech startups. So where we're headed is we are right now developing a lot of really exciting technology tools to sort of catch up the technology to our content, which is really the magic of what we built. Please share CommonLit with every teacher in your network. It is completely free. It is commonlit.org. And I hope to talk to you after the presentation. Thank you. Can you guys hear me okay? Wonderful. So, uh, my name is Craig Jones, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Formative, goformative.com. Um, our site is one of the first sites to ever allow a teacher to actually intervene while their students are working in real time. I'm gonna show you what that looks like. But first, I wanna tell you about where I came from. I taught in Los Angeles from 2008 to 2012. I was an eighth grade science teacher like Dan, and these are some of my students. Interestingly, these students came in with the label of sheltered, which is probably the most disrespectful label I've ever heard students given, but that was their class code. 14% um, of them, and actually of all my students that year, even my honor students, went on to become proficient in math, or sci or, or in math that year. However, I'm proud to say that Every single one of those students got the highest score possible in science, except for one, who got proficient. Disappointed, but it's okay. <laughs> um, in fact, 110 of my students scored advanced that year, and I was extremely proud because that was just the minimum bar that I set as an expectation for my students. The problem, though, 
is that that's really hard. In fact, it feels nearly impossible to identify each student's needs and make interventions before class is over. And if you reread that, that might sound like, of course it's impossible to identify each student's needs and make interventions before class is over. But that's called teaching. It's nearly impossible to teach. So, we made an original solution. In fact, I made a lot of original solutions. Every single day in my classroom, I would go on Google Forms and clickers and build things and, and pretty much do what every teacher who tries to use data in their classroom does. Build those fancy trackers, do all that stuff. But after the classroom, I was able to get some funding and build a more official solution to share with other teachers. And it was pretty ugly. You would simply take any resource that you'd like, a PDF or a Word document or an image, anything you wanted, upload it to our website and add these little input areas on top so that your students would then be able to answer those assignments. You'd send the assignment with a link that you put on the board or a quick code. And then your students could answer on any device, iPad, tablet, Chromebook, phone. And while they're responding, this was a demonstration we did in KIPP uh, New Orleans, the teacher can either project or look at a screen that shows all the activity in their classroom at that very moment in real time. As the students are clicking, each one of those fields updates. Every single keystroke they make and so then the teacher would instantly be able to auto grade or click and grade on a rubric to be able to notice trends in their classroom and hopefully intervene before the students leave. You might notice that question three, there's a trend that's going on that's not good and more students are missing it. So you'd actually stop the class, reteach, or you'd notice individual students. And before you walked by in their shoulders, you knew what was going on in their, in their kind of thought process and you could intervene anonymously and, and it really actually works. In fact, there's studies that show that this method of teaching, this formative method, rapidly speeding up the feedback cycle, can make a teacher nearly twice as effective, adding eight months of additional impact per student per year. Now we've evolved a lot. We've had over 50,000 teachers and over 1 million students use formative since we launched it publicly last year, January 20th, 2015. And it looks a lot better and feels a lot better and I really invite you guys to take a look. Now you can see much more complex student responses, drawings, pictures that they upload, large text responses. You can click on the student work to zoom in and make a full screen view. You can grade, you can give feedback directly in the system. Additionally, you can see trends and take action much more clearly. And this is just the beginning. Coming next, we're really excited that you'll be able to tag standards and track student growth to those standards and maybe build common formative assessments to share across colleagues and school districts. What I ask from you is very, very simple. Visit formative, goformative.com. Give us feedback. It's not perfect yet, but we're working super hard. Tweet to at goformative and just say what you think. It really helps. The tweets are incredibly powerful. Give me your personal feedback after the session. And most of all, if you really believe in this mission, Become a formative partner school. With 200 partner schools, we can be self-sustaining forever. So if you're interested in becoming a partner school, please talk to me. Thank you very much. My name is Yamoy Toussaint and I founded STEM from Dance. Our goal is to transform the way we reach diversity in STEM and to see 200,000 girls of color take the stage as the next generation of engineers, scientists, and techies. Now, you may be wondering, what does that have to do with dance? How does dance and STEM fit together? Before I answer those questions, I first want to ground us in why I think we should be passionate about diversity in STEM. And I'll start by sharing my own story. So since I've been young, I've always liked to dance, and I've always loved all things math, which is something that has run in my family. My father has been an engineer for 40 plus years, and because of his influence, I decided to study mechanical engineering at MIT. So while I was there, I felt so empowered by all these things I was learning and all these opportunities that were available to me, uh, but I was disappointed by how few people there were who looked like me. Um, I often felt isolated and like I didn't belong. Um, 
And that year, I was one of two black women to graduate from the mechanical engineering department that year. Um, so if you look, oh, thank you. Thank you. I wasn't expecting that. All right, so if you look across the STEM workforce, um, black and Latino women comprise just 4%, despite being 15% of the population. So going back to my story, I joined Teach America after I graduated, and um, I discovered a barrier that both my high school math students faced and my peers at MIT, and it was confidence. It is amazing to me how much our mindset impacts what we can achieve. And so it was the combination of these experiences that I started STEM from dance. So at STEM from Dance, we tackle three key barriers. Being exposed to STEM, being ready to think like an engineer or a scientist, and having the confidence to believe, yes, I could do it. So going back to the question of why and how we use dance. So originally, we spent half the time teaching dance and then the other half doing math tutoring. Um, however, the feedback that we got from teachers and students was that it felt like two separate programs. And so we spent the next few cycles and years of the program just figuring out how to integrate the two. And I am so excited about where we've landed. So I think a great illustration of this is one of the projects that we have the girls work on. So over the span of about 10 weeks, the girls create digital art through computer coding. So here's an example of what that could look like. So we have some triangles going from one side, they go to the other, and they sort of swirl around in the middle. So in addition to that, they create choreography to match what they've coded. And when they perform it, this digital art is projected behind them um, at the same time. So to demonstrate this, I'm going to play a video of one of our stem from dancers create, who created a movement to the, dig, to, the, um, to the triangle art that you just saw. So you can see it projected in the background. Pretty neat, right? <laughs> oh, right. <Yeah. laughs> All right, so let's just break down what's happening here. First, they're getting exposed to STEM, just like the exposure I received from my father. Second, they get to see that um, the way that you think and solve problems as an engineer, as a coder, is similar to how you think as a dancer and a choreographer, and that you don't have to be left or right brain, but that you can be both, and that what comes from a combination is greater than either of them standing alone. And then third, we work on their confidence. We want to build confident girls that when they look in the mirror, they don't see their race, their class, their background as a barrier, but they see themselves as strong and capable and as people who belong in STEM. And lastly, we have fun. We focus on building a safe space where they could grow, develop, and just have a good time together. So quickly, a few things about our model. We are based in schools and community centers. We target middle and high school age girls, and we work with them weekly. So currently, this year, we will go through 10 cycles of our program with four schools, 150 girls. Next year, our target is 30 cycles, 20 schools, and 450 girls. So to get there, I'm looking for connections to school networks, large community organizations, companies, foundations. So if you have those connections, or even if you don't, uh, feel free to reach out to me there. Thank you. Um, real quick, you guys, we're going to do a Q&A panel at the end, so as you guys are thinking of questions that you want to follow up with, there will be an opportunity. If you can jot them down, please do so. Um, we have four more presentations left and then Q&A, so jot down. Hello, everyone. My name is Brendan Finch, and I am the um, CEO and founder of Third Brain Education. Our mission is that every student should read, every student should grow, and every student should learn and in the order it's up there now that I just said. Um, <laughs> so students need to read in every classroom. I mean, you guys heard it from Common Lit earlier. It's extremely important that students are reading. Um, ELA teachers have their Jedi mind tricks that they do, but science and social studies teachers do not have a lot of resources to get their kids reading. Um, and if the textbook is inaccessible, and if you are in the classroom, you are all here, I expect you are probably in the classroom, um, you need resources to get your students reading. Um, and independently. So here's, here's what I faced. So I taught in LA for seven years. I was a seventh grade science and math teacher. I had students reading from the third to eighth grade levels in my classroom. The textbook was inaccessible to most of them. Raise your hand if your classroom looked something like this, where you had students at all kinds of different levels. 
No way. Um, so, <laughs> so what I started doing is I started writing science articles for my kids. Raise your hand again if you've ever written articles for your kids. I'm really surprised. Um, so we, I wrote articles with engaging narratives. I wrote articles with relevant examples and standalone content so it wasn't full of jargon so my kids could just dive into this one topic and understand it well. Um, I also found like really cool art and cartoons and fun stuff so that the kids were like, science is inspiring, science is fantastic, because it is. Um, so fast forward um, about five years. So just like Dan was talking about, the last time I was at this event, Birdman was an idea and I got to connect with a bunch of entrepreneurs um, and I got to talk to them about my idea and now, you know, we're here. So um, we have an adaptive science and social studies platform. We write articles at seven different reading levels. Um, we diagnose student reading levels when they first log in and serve the same content to every student at their reading level and then we adapt the level they receive as they improve to make sure that everyone is constantly challenged and that all of your students are comprehending what they're reading. Um, <coughs> teachers receive reports on student comprehension. You also get a breakdown of specific vocab terms that your students struggled with so that you know what you need to reteach. Um, and your, your teachers or your students get to read independently. And if they're three or four grade levels behind, that might not be happening. So this gives them the tool to gain that confidence to succeed beyond your classroom, not just in your classroom. Um, our artwork speaks for itself. It's really important to me that when students log into our website, they do not have this schema for failure that they may hold with textbooks. Like, social studies is fascinating. Science is awesome. All of our students should think this way when they dive into these subjects. Um, feedback is really crucial to everything we build. I was a teacher for seven years. I'm building this for teachers. Um, all new development comes from teacher feedback. It was bird brain science to start with. Now we have bird brain history because we had a bunch of social studies teachers that said, uh, like, we want what our science teachers are using. Um, we also constantly reach out to people with how's the bird running email. So you don't even have to reach out to us. You'll probably get, if you sign up for a trial, you're going to get an email from me in a month to say, how's it going? Like, how's the bird running? Um, it's really important that you respond if you guys end up doing this because we really, really, really want to hear what you think. Um, we want to create a culture of feedback because we think that you should shape the tools that are being developed for your classrooms. This is extremely important to us and to everyone up here, I know. Um, so the future of bird brain, so we have science and social studies. We're also developing NGSS lesson plans um, with rigorous common core line questions, print and go, real simple stuff like the worksheets that you might find online so that you don't have to search for a reading and you don't have to search for scaffolded lesson plans. Um, Birdbrain Espanol is also in the pipeline. Um, and maybe even Birdbrain Math or ELA, so different levels of linguistic complexity in math problems so that your students can go from number three plus three to a word problem with the same function. Um, and so much more. So um, Birdbrain is named because my name, my last name is Finch. So that's kind of where it comes from. But um, also, so in the mid-2000s, a consortium of avian scientists got together um, to talk about the, the names of the structures of the avian brain. And they actually renamed structures in the bird's brain. So we thought for a long time that birds were dumb. I mean, there's some negative connotations to the term bird brain, right? That's not what we're about. So they actually renamed these structures because they discovered that the birds, so human cortexes, obviously, you know, like high processing, this is what gives us all of our magic human power. Um, but birds actually don't have a cortex, but their brains are interconnected in a very unique way, which we didn't know initially. We'd assumed that they were very primitive structures. So they had to go in and rename these structures because the names themselves of the avian brain had negative connotations. So if you have students um, that maybe think of themselves as bird brains, if you have students that are in your classroom and are not very confident with reading and don't have accessible text, I would love to talk to you. Um, Come talk to me here or talk to us in the education marketplace. We're all about free pilots. Um, we love for teachers to, to try us out for a few months, see if they like us. We are 11 times less expensive than the only other competitor that we have in the market. So we are extremely accessible as well. I would love to come speak with you. And if you're an entrepreneur and you need entrepreneurs to connect with, come talk to me too. I had a lot of advice from a lot of amazing CFA entrepreneurs. And I'd love to help you as well. So thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Andre Seigler, and I'm the founder and CEO of Enriched Schools. 
One simple question for you. When I say the word substitute teacher, what comes to mind? Call it out. Chaos. Chaos. Scared. Who's that? Waste. Who's that? Movies. I'd like to introduce you to Asia Rainey. Some words that come to mind when I think of Asia. Passionate. Professional. Veteran. Creative. Dynamic. Experienced. You might be surprised to know that Asia Rainey is a substitute teacher. Why does this matter? Well, that's the number of months of a, a student's entire life that are spent with a substitute teacher over their entire school career. Ten, that's the number of days the average teacher is out every, uh, every single year. And days that you might have been, like me, worrying about what's happening in your absence. And 120, that's the average number of minutes a school leader spends scrambling to find a trusted sub or arranging internal coverage every morning. And the result? Ineffective teaching, pockets of busy work, movie days, total loss of student learning. We're failing kids. I know this because I lived it as a high school English teacher, and I bet there are many of you in this room right now who can relate whether you're a teacher, or you're an alum, you're a system leader, the entire substitute staffing system is broken until now. Meet Tank. She's not a substitute. She's an enriched guest educator. Meet engaged kids. They're learning, even though their teacher is out. Meet Enrich. We recruit, we screen, and we match. Passionate professionals to schools who need quality substitute teachers. Great schools like Encore Academy, where Principal Smith considers us a really important part of her plan for teacher sustainability and for student achievement. And our guest educators, they're amazing. They bring their diverse backgrounds, their careers, their experiences to every single day they cover, whether uh, a few hours, a few weeks, or more. Folks like Laura Byrne, a Teach for America alum, who thinks of us as a great way to stay connected to kids and to balance her freelance writing schedule. So we were launched in New Orleans, where I was a core member, and really proud to say we've grown to serve as the region's leading provider of substitute teachers and other flex flexible staff. Along the way, we've mobilized hundreds of guest teachers and impacted thousands of kids. And we're growing. So with an amazing team, we've grown from one to four cities. Uh, we're actually here in, in D.C., as well as um, Miami, led by our extraordinary team, Darla Bunting, who may be here. Darla, if you're here. Darla Bunting, over there, Darla, wave. Uh, and, and Kelly Bonilla in Miami-Dade. Kelly, are you here? And our vision, every single student and every single school des deserves a great substitute teacher. And I've also learned along the way that our community and schools must work together if we're going to solve the challenge that we face. Our vision is to grow local cohorts of guest teachers in every single city across the country. At Enrich, we believe that our communities are really overflowing with talent, and we must work in partnership with neighborhoods, with schools, to really uh, serve kids and, and provide an excellent education. So my name is Andre. I'd love to connect with you. Uh, if you're interested in being a guest teacher, maybe you're here in DC, uh, step off the sidelines, jump in, please uh, let us know. If you're interested in our model, perhaps bringing Enrich to your city or your school, please reach out. Uh, and if you're a school, I would love to talk to you as well. Send us an email, find us on Twitter, follow us, and uh, hopefully we'll connect soon. Thanks so much, guys. So first, I want to start by uh, thanking Teach for America for having me here today. My name is Ryan Hoax. I'm the founder and CEO of Overgrad, a web platform that helps students find the path to opportunity through their education. So why Overgrad? Why? How did it come to be? Uh, I was a high school math teacher in St. Louis Public Schools. I taught all juniors, and the first question I asked my juniors when they walked in my door 
was who here wants to go to college? About 90% of my students put their hands in the air. And then I said, where do you want to go to school? Not expecting great responses, but it was SLU, Mizzou, and Wash U. Shout at the top of their lungs, so excited. Then we took a practice ACT. The average ACT for my students was a 15, and the average GPA was a 2.5. See, my students had no idea that there was a difference between wanting to go to college and actually being prepared to go to college. So while 90% of my students told me they wanted to go to college, in the end, only 8% would graduate. And so out of that, we decided to found Overgrad. And this is what Overgrad looked like at the start. The idea was pretty simple, right? How can we provide transparent expectations so students aren't guessing if they're on track or off track as early as possible? We started by only offering data on 150 schools that we could find. We started in you know, a wealthy public school, uh, a low-income charter school, and then kind of a mixed income, just to kind of see what, how students responded to this. Um, I had a lot of support. What you see in the top right corner were my teammates at Deloitte. When I decided to quit my job and start Overgrad, they kind of gave me the startup toolkit, and so that was all their signatures on it. And that's my co-founder in the bottom right, as well as old university kind of coding and building the original version of, uh, of Overgrad. And, and today, this is what it looks like. So we've advanced the platform quite a bit. Um, it looks pretty similar, but we've advanced a lot in terms of what we can do and the guidance that we can provide. So what you see here is the student represented by the blue bar. Uh, we're able to do things like if they enter an Explore score, an Aspire score, automatically predict what their ACT and SAT scores might be. So schools and districts can use a common language with their students. Uh, this student immediately knows that my GPA is off track. My ACT score, my projected SAT score is off track for this school. And that's, that's what my juniors and seniors were seeing. Right? It's a very discouraging picture to find out. It always really bugged me that we waited to tell kids this information when it was too late to actually do anything about it. And so that 3.02 GPA that that student has that puts them way off track for University of Illinois, if they're a 10th grader and they find out this information, if they get all A's, that becomes a 3.67, which is right at what University of Illinois expects them to have. And what this does for students by giving them this data at an early stage is it buys them time. It gives them a chance to actually attain the opportunity instead of having it defined for them. We do other things like course plans. So for students, right, there's a lot of data and research that supports. If you build a four-year course plan, you know what's on the horizon, and I know what's expected of me. Graduation rates go up. So students can see my meeting graduation requirements for all my different course subjects. Uh, we allow students to follow careers, and we immediately connect that to the colleges that are aligned to those careers. So students aren't left guessing, do I need a two-year degree? Do I need a four-year degree? What are the schools responsible for me to go there? We can grab all that data, present it to the student in a very actionable way. So now it's what do I need to do instead of did I do it? And this is what it would look like when a student is following multiple goals, all displayed on one list so they have that actionable feedback for all the colleges and careers that they're looking to attend. So it turns out a lot of schools have, have kind of agreed with me on this mission of we need to provide transparency so students know and understand the expectations that they need to meet. We're in over 600 schools that are around the country and globally, serving over 48,000 students who've created over 80,000 post-secondary goals. Uh, and many of those students are actually freshmen and sophomores in high school, which is so great for me to know um, the fact that typically these conversations were happening with juniors and seniors before that. We work with schools like Intrinsic, Noble, uh, Harlem Children's Zone, but we also work with rural schools, Big city schools, public, private, every type of schools, if you sit in any one of those, I'd love to talk to you afterwards. We're built by a great team, so my co-founder and I are the two on the left that have built and kind of grown Overgrad from the start, and we recently added Brad Whitwell, who was TFA National in 2013, and Aaron Lohr, who was TFA Chicago in 2008. What's next for us? So we really want to help facilitate this process, including the transition phase, so integrating with Google Drive. Uh, and parchment for electronic transcripts. So imagine Google Drive. Students have a centralized location of working on college essays and recommendations that can very easily be shared and leveraged and attached to applications. We're also looking at providing pathways not only for college, not only for career, but also for the military. So for the students that want to go into the military, there's a crazy statistic that over 50% of students that want to go to the military aren't qualified to do so because of something on their record that tells them not be able to go down that pathway. Uh, so who do I want to talk to? So some of you might recognize the companies on the left. If you use Naviance, we're free. Naviance is very expensive. A lot of schools use us instead of Naviance because they don't really like how it works with their students. Use Cooter, Kirkusian, things along those lines. There's definitely a place for us to fit uh, in that environment. I love high schools, community-based organizations, and if anyone here is investors, I'd love to talk to you as well. 
Again, work overtime, and we're helping students attain the future that they so desire. Thank you so much. I stand before you as a confident leader who's traveled the world impacting the lives of young women, allowing for them to have the power to find strength in their voice, the strength of knowing that they are incredible women, and also allowing them to know that they too can be the change. But it wasn't always that way. I was once a part of the 68%. I grew up in a predominantly white environment where I never had a teacher or a leader who looked like me. Oftentimes, I would sit in class, especially in February, when the teacher would say, it's Black History Month, and I would cringe in my seat because I knew that everyone was going to turn and look at me. I was so uncomfortable with my difference that at times I would go home after playing outside and get in the shower and scrub and scrub until I got all the dirt off, hoping that I'd get some of the brown off too. I was a part of the 68%. 68% of girls of color struggle with their difference, their self-esteem, and their ability to step up and lead. A turning point in my life was when I went to college and I began to build relationships and have mentors who shared my ethnic background. It transformed my view of myself, my confidence, and for me to be able to find my voice and be proud of who I was. In that moment when I was finding myself, my passion also grew for young women who sat in those same seats as me around the world. In 2009, Women Empowering Nations was established. It's an international nonprofit organization dedicated to the advancement of girls of color through self-esteem development, leadership, and global education programs. Version one of this organization started in the Gambia, West Africa, where we started with an outdoor classroom of 30 young women, connecting them with pen pals in Oklahoma City, where they built relationships beyond borders. But it wasn't until my time as a core member in 2011 that Women Empowering Nations took its shape in its signature program, Girls Leading Our World, where through my connections with my students, I truly identified the social, emotional, and leadership development needs of girls of color. I developed a curriculum and took them through a year-long mentorship process with leadership development workshops. And my favorite piece was exposure. It wasn't until 2013 that I really began to think about the fact that I could tell my students all day about experiences that I had had abroad, but it would be so powerful to show them. So in, 20, in 2013, I took the girls global I had a travel seminar to Casablanca, Morocco, and to Banjul, the Gambia, where they not only got to be exposed to African culture, but they also participated in a leadership development workshop that Wynn hosted there, and they built those relationships for themselves. This experience was documented in the award-winning film, The World They Knew. It highlights the story of three travel seminar participants where you get to see an in-depth view of their perspective before this experience happened what it meant for them to grow as leaders, to find themselves, and to truly value education. I encourage you to check out the film at TWTK.org. Since 2009, Women Empowering Nations has exposed girls to five different countries. We have 32 global volunteers. We've served over 2,000 young women, and we've traveled 49,444 miles for global girls' exposure. We operate in Tulsa, Oklahoma, in Oklahoma City, Houston, Texas, Banjul, the Gambia, and we're expanding to Mwanza, Tanzania this summer. Our goal now is to continue to grow across the United States. We're looking for schools to partner with, teachers that want these programs for your young women. And we want to infuse technology in the work we're doing for virtual mentorship and to bring our workshops to classrooms and to homes of young women in locations where we're not physically located. So today, I want to connect with teachers, with school leaders, and anyone who has a passion for developing the lives of young women 
I'm here to support and lend an ear or give you advice, and I also welcome individuals who want to volunteer with our efforts. We aspire to not only develop the lives of more young women to grow and love themselves as leaders, but we want for them to find their own voice to be the change as global game changers. Thank you. Alrighty, not too shabby, eh? Right? All right, so uh, if you guys could do a one last round of applause for all eight entrepreneurs who came up here and came to the stage today. And really quickly before we move into Q&A again, make sure you have your questions. There are two mics, one here and one here on either row, but we're going to bring the entrepreneurs up in two sets. But I'm curious, by a show of hands, how many of you heard something today that you were inspired by? Anybody? Give you a little goosebump? Yeah? First of all, how many of you by a show of hands um, saw a product or service that you're really excited about? Awesome. Good. I think we did our job then. Now it's your turn to ask any follow-up questions you have. So the first group of entrepreneurs that we're going to bring up here are Carlisa, Brandon, Andre, and Ryan. Do you guys give them a round of applause? Is that awesome? Okay. Alrighty. So you guys are going to have to share the mics. I think you know all about that from teaching in classrooms. Um, so the first question I want to ask you real quick before opening it up to the floor is, um, several of you talked about your uh, experiences as classroom teachers and how they obviously influenced your evolution of your product, right? The problem you saw and identified and how you decided to tackle it. Um, but I don't know if there's anyone in the audience who maybe is interested in scratching their own itch and may have some ideas that have been circulating around but aren't sure if they should make the jump yet or even if they could do it while they're a classroom teacher or administrator, et cetera. So the first question is actually for Carlisha and Brandon. Um, I'm curious, Carlisha is, I don't think you mentioned it, but the executive director of a total management organization, as well as the CEO of Women Empower Nation, and the best selling author, and, 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 and. Um, so keep busy. Uh, I'm curious as to what is your advice to other educators or school leaders who may want to do something but aren't sure how to balance it or can we do it? Can you give us some of your secrets, please? Absolutely. So I'd say that Women Empowering Nations, as I mentioned, I brought it with me into the classroom, but I think the best part of it was starting in the classroom. Even though it was juggling a lot, start with a small subset of students. Like I started with 30 girls, started with 30 girls in West Africa, and it grew. But I also think that one thing that I didn't do in the beginning that I've learned along the way is to utilize the support. People want to get involved. They want to volunteer have specific functions for individuals to support you along your journey. Um, as I run the school and I run the nonprofit, I find balance and joy in the work of social entrepreneurship. It's going home to a hobby to me at times and not so much another job. So do what you love, start now, start small if you have to, but start. Awesome, and Brendan, you had seven years in the classroom. Yes, so Did I, I actually, so I was teaching for three years that I was working on bird brain. So nights and weekends I'd work on on the on the product while you know lesson planning and, and teaching the rest of the time. Um, I think what was fantastic about that is you're super in touch with what's going on in the classroom. So you can test things in your classroom and you can start super duper small. So I mean, you just build a couple things and try them out. Um, send them to all of your friends. You have access to this amazing network of very very experienced and rock star teachers and school leaders through Teach for America. There are tons of people that you can talk to and get help from. I mean, I, I probably had 50 meetings with other alumni entrepreneurs just to bounce ideas off of them, um, you know, call them on the phone. I mean, people from all over the country um, got in touch. I got in touch with, like, contact alumni regions, and there's people that will help you out, and there's people that will, they just want you to do amazing things. They want to help you do that. So reach out to your network. There's a lot of resources here. Awesome. And next question, Andre and Ryan. Um, I know both of you are seasoned entrepreneurs at this point. Your operations have been going on for several years, and as anyone could tell from your presentations, you guys seem, ha seem to have through-the-roof confidence. But I'm wondering if it was ever not the case. 
Did you ever have a case of the imposter syndrome? Where coming from the classroom teacher, you didn't feel like you were necessarily a business person or an entrepreneur. And if you did have any of those insecurities, I know I did, um, how did you get over that and what would be your advice to why educators are some of the best entrepreneurs out there? Whoever wants to go first. Okay, Chad, I absolutely, definitely have had that sense of what am I doing, imposter syndrome. I think Dan talked about being passionate about the problem you're solving. I think that is always what grounds me when I feel you know, uncertain about you know, title of CEO or what am I supposed to be doing at each stage of growth is if you just come back to who am I trying to serve and what are they telling me and like really listening to the user uh, and then also just being passionate about what you're trying to fix or solve. Uh, but I'm definitely absolutely have had that kind of, you know, moment where you're like, gosh, I mean, not, not just once, but over and over again. Uh, so, yeah. The only thing that I would add is I don't think that those are really like mutually exclusive things. Uh, if you truly care about what you're doing and the direction that you're heading, I'm sure Dan, even with their success right now, has these moments. It never really goes away because you're you're constantly thinking, I could be doing more, I can be doing better. Uh, you doubt yourself, like, why hasn't this happened or why isn't it doing it exactly like this? I think that's a natural thing that we experience as teachers too. And I think we all became very good for those of us that taught in the classroom of pushing through those moments, those roller coaster moments, because you know that there's gonna be those lows, but like you live for those highs that come from it. And I think entrepreneurship and teaching are, are very similar in those aspects. Great, and this is a question for anyone who's excited to answer it, but again, the intention with hosting this event is really to start connecting more strategically the educators and school leaders with the entrepreneurs and their innovations. And so this is a start, right? This hasn't always been the case with Teach for America. And so I'm really curious as to if any of you have had an aha moment of sorts for what recommendation would you give if Wendy Kopp was sitting right here with us as to how Teach for America can help with the connection process between the entrepreneurs in the alumni group and the educators. Does anyone have any ideas? She's not here, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> no? Um, yeah, I, I can go. I'll, I'll say something. So uh, to, be, <laughs> to be quite honest, I'm pretty underwhelmed by uh, what Teach for America has done uh, in the sense of kind of connecting us and bringing us together. I think, like, although we're entrepreneurs, there's people in the classroom, like, we're all united around this, this common problem of we know that something's not quite right, and we want to solve it and move towards that. And I think unite around that vision, it's not as like, I want a channel to push overhead to people, but like what I think you mentioned and what's so critical in entrepreneurship is you need people that are willing to just flat out tell you, that sucks, that's really good, like you can't be doing this because what we miss when you're not in the classroom anymore is you don't get to see that every day, right? You, you see this big picture, but you don't really know what's going on in the weeds. and so to have that channel, if anything, I think what could have what could be better is just a channel to get feedback. So if you saw something, I'll say this right now, that sucks about overgrad, please, I want to hear that. I don't want to hear anything that's good. I want to know what I could be doing better. So it's just ryan at overgrad.com, but facilitating channels like that, um, I think would be fantastic. I think, I, I don't think anyone's really nailed this down um, anywhere in the whole industry. And this is like a major issue, not with Teach for America, but with e educators and entrepreneurs, period. Um, that there's very little connection between them. And I would say, so connecting us, I mean, it would be, it would be neat if there were school leaders that were like, I wanna do something innovative, I wanna do something cool, and we could, you know, like somehow they could curate or connect with whatever the needs that those school leaders have. So if you're a school leader with needs, or I mean, please hear from the team, but send them an email and say like, hey, we have these needs, are there any entrepreneurs trying to tackle these issues? Um, and then get some direct connections, so there's direct feedback, I mean, Tell us that it sucks. Tell us that it's awesome. And that's like the fuel that drives our engine, both of those things, not just one. But yeah, I would say that's what I'm trying Awesome. To and as I ask my last question, if anyone has questions, if you guys could line up at either microphone for the panelists, because we're gonna wrap up here in about 10 minutes, and then we're gonna bring up the next set of entrepreneurs. So again, if you have any questions for the entrepreneurs up here right now, please come up and line up um, so that I can make sure to get through your questions. Um, and there's mics on both sides. Um, so if uh, this one, I think I tried to give you guys a heads up because I don't like to spook people. 
But um, there's a lot of content today, right? From all the way when Dan and Jin Su were here to Carlisha wrapped us up and brought us home. And I want to make it really simple for people to cement what you do in their mind. So if you could just give three words to leave with this audience about who you are or what you do or anything you want them to remember, what would those three words be? And I'll start with Andre. Quality substitute teaching. Oh, good. Uh, Carlisha? Global leadership development. For this town to prove hyphenated, college and career readiness. <laughs> Every student reading. Nice. All right. Well done. You are entrepreneurs. Simple. All right. We'll take the first question from the audience. And if you have it for a general, um, for everybody, feel free. Or if you want to talk to a specific person, that's fine. Okay. Great. Uh, my name is CJ Matthews. I did uh, the New York Corps in 2011. I'm happy to be here. While my question is private, I think I'm going to ask it on this public forum because I think that it can add value to other entrepreneurs. Um, and I think it's almost specific to Enriched but anyone is feel free to answer it. So when I'm thinking about innovation, right, it's usually synonymous with change, and that means that you have to convince a principal, right, for the work that I do, to actually take action. So I'm wondering, when you started out, how did you begin to have the conversation with individual schools and in getting these schools, whether it's individual schools or districts, to actually take action on a startup and invite them into the school to do that work? Thank you. CJ, that's such a great question, and I think uh, rather than say take action, I would say first listen, right? For, for us, the first thing that I did was have a lot of conversations. Um, we actually had two teachers, a, a dance teacher and a yoga teacher, who I asked if they could come in and do a guest lesson at uh, Renew Cultural Arts Academy. And you know, they did that, and then I asked for feedback. I said, how'd it go? You know, what was great? What wasn't great? Would you have them back? Would you have them back as a, you know, enrichment teacher? Would you have them back as a substitute teacher? Um, and those conversations where I'm not actually selling at all, I'm really listening. I'm saying, like, I think you might have this challenge. I, you know, maybe you have this problem, but I want to understand more uh, from your standpoint what that looks like. That's the most kind of effective way I found to really create a solution that is responsive and that is going to be used and bought and uh, something that, that, that works rather than something that you're trying to sell. You know, sort of the idea of don't hold on to your uh, solution so hard that you miss what people are really telling you. I don't know if other folks have other thoughts. I can weigh on that a little, a little bit. Um, so I think you know, if, if you have something and, and there's a teacher that's passionate about that, that that's how they, like they will sell what you're doing to their school leader. And that nobody better to do that. I shouldn't be the one like selling that principle on some solution that the teacher's like, I love this thing. Or like this, this has made incredible gains. This has helped me so much. Then like that's how you get in. And you find a couple people to give you you know, crazy positive feedback, and I mean, they do it. You, you don't, you don't, you don't have to facilitate that. I mean, facilitate the conversation. You know, ask them to talk to their school leader, but that's it. Yeah. Awesome. And we'll jump here to the next question. Hi. I have two questions, but they're hyphenated. Um, <laughs> <laughs> one is, it seems like the the typical revenue model is, you know, don't charge the schools anything, um, and somehow get the money elsewhere. I don't know uh, if any of you tried to actually get principals to pay you for whatever it was you pr were providing and what your experience was with that. And then the second question is, um, in terms of if I'm looking to get into schools, um, is it just a scramble process, you know, talk to the teachers you know and they'll talk to the principal? Like, what recommendations do you have for that? So the first question, just to clarify, was about how if like they have experience getting principals to, to pay for their products. To actually pay, like it, it seems like that's very difficult. And you could just say it's difficult. I'm just want to hear that. So yeah. Like I can <laughs> let go. Uh, <laughs> it's difficult. It's, it's <laughs> difficult. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm a free fly. I can address the second one though. Um, so, which was now I just blanked on what the question was again. So the second one was just how do you get into yeah, other schools, yeah. even for demos, that type of Perfect, thing, something yeah. efficient. So if you would have attended my outbound sales 101 session that I gave yesterday, I kind of <laughs> talked about this. But I think this is a, this is a, um, 
A really important concept, I won't go into it in a ton of depth, but in education, there's a lot of open data that you can use to figure out who your potential customers might be. And through conversations like when Andre had, you figured out who are out of that group, like what are the characteristics that define that person who's gonna have the problem and understand the problem. And then you can use different structures and systems to say, these are the people that have the problem. I can do individual, so at first for us, it was going around to every school in Illinois. I would travel everywhere. And I just wanna talk to you in person. And then that built me credibility. And I was speaking to a room full of superintendents and kind of worked up from that way. Now that we've gotten bigger, we just kind of do some targeted email outreach to let people know kind of as to raise awareness. You're gonna get rejected a lot. You might only get seven to 12% of those people to respond to you, but it becomes very predictable. So if anyone's looking at building something, apply some rigor to it, make it very predictable, know that you're gonna be told no a lot, but how many conversations do you need to have to get the correct number of yeses at the bottom? And you really wanna to try to figure that out as quickly as possible, so you know that I can pour resources up here, and this is gonna produce this on the other end. It took us a long time to figure that out. More than happy to talk to you more about it if you want advice on it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and next question. Hi, my name is Javon, and I'm a special, special education teacher at a school in Holland. Uh, my question was just about Overgrad, and specifically, like, to what extent have you partnered with schools to um, help them track school growth on uh, IEP-related post-secondary goals, and just what specific resources or tools does your website have for doing that? Yeah, so um, currently we don't do anything in terms of tracking, like, IEP goals or things along those lines. We do... Oh, I'm sorry, I'm like, not going to do those, but post-secondary goals. Yeah. Um, for IEP. So, for, from, the, from the school's perspective, how do we help track on that? Yeah, so we have, uh, so what I didn't show you, I mostly showed you the student side of the equation, but we have a whole educator dashboard. And so if there's any sort of reports on like, what goals have students set, both college and career related, what has matriculation looked like from a post-secondary perspective, so we can track all those things. The electronic transcript is actually gonna help with that facilitation. And then as we move forward, we also wanna start making like recommendations off of that. So including your kids wanna go into this career, that means that you should be offering these sort of courses and these sort of pathways. I think a lot of times schools don't understand what, are our, what outcomes do our kids want, and so we're trying to bring those to light through our platform. Last question. Hi, I'm Shira, I'm a Metro Atlanta 2015 core member, and I teach high school, so this question is also sort of specific for overgrad. Um, I'm wondering, because I think it is really important to expose students to what they're gonna need to be able to accomplish their goals, specifically college or career readiness, but a lot of times they don't recognize it, and my fear is that once you expose it to them, they'll become discouraged and not want to pursue those goals because it is a lot of work, and when they realize how much it is, they won't want to put in the effort. So I was wondering if you have suggestions or if you have anything in your software that helps um, create goals that are appropriate for what the student's GPA, what their grade scores are, and then also help facilitate them achieving those goals? Yeah, great question. So I'll try to be very quick here for time. So we do have the ability to search by match reaching safety schools so the student can see what's aligned to me academically at all points throughout high school. So that, that's computed automatically for the students so they can kind of do that exploration. Um, I think you bring up a very fair point and that's a feedback that we get a lot. Kids get discouraged when they see that data. I think the argument is, well, what's the alternative? That you keep that hidden from them and then they learn about it when they're seniors and then they can't do anything about it. So we go in light of transparency versus like trying to keep this in the dark. Uh, and then we have a lot of activities, curriculum, things that we've built along those lines that help schools understand how can I introduce this concept, what topic should we, or conversation should we be having, and all that's kind of available on our platform for free to use. Yeah. Awesome, and I just wanna say one thing because um, I know, uh, it was intentional when we uh, gathered all the entrepreneurs that we have nonprofits and we have ed tech products and we have services. And one thing that I think is sometimes overlooked that I ex think is extremely important, thinking through how you're building your business is understanding the difference between a startup and a small business or a nonprofit. And I would like Carlicia, if you can speak a little bit about what was your customer retention or customer acquisition process like and how, how is it different, just so people are aware. So I'd say I, I definitely, as I mentioned, I started through working in my own school with the students that I had available to me, but sa similar to everyone else, utilizing the network. So principals who I had close relationships with and building those relationships to get more girls in our programs. When I moved to another school, using that school site, so it, it's heavily built along relationships and sustaining those connections with families and with girls through collecting the outcomes, the data, and supporting 
principals with the knowledge of what our program can bring to their school population. Awesome. And to address the gentleman's question about the principals and how to get them to pay, how many principals or school leaders do we have by a show of hands in here? Raise them high so we can see. There you go. I just got you a pool of people to talk to. If you guys want to congregate over here at the end of the session, feel free. Go ahead. Now you know who they are. Thank you later. Okay. Um, that's it for this panel. If you guys give a big round of applause. And the very final portion of this event is our second panel with Dan, Jisoo, Craig, Michelle, and Yamali. There they go. I do that. <laughs> All righty. And remember, if you have questions, I will definitely save time at the end. Um, as they're getting settled in, for the sake of time, I'm going to actually start asking my questions. Um, the first one, um, the presentation, Dan and Jen Su, that you guys did at the beginning really prompted something for me because you're talking about the use of all these educational tools and apps for schools and how we're leveraging Clever. I'm curious, um, thinking back to my perspective as a teacher and all the teachers that I work with, sometimes, and nod your head if you're in agreement, sometimes it can feel teachers and school leaders a bit overwhelming when you have product and service after product and service after product and service. Right? And it can be hard to sift through which ones are effective and which ones aren't, and how do you know how long you should test it before keeping it or letting it go, et cetera. I see some nods. Good. So I would love if you could give the audience some advice on how do they uh, distinguish and make these types of decisions as to when to pursue a product and when not to, and how to just get through all the clutter. Yeah, so I can see some of the principles after you're like, oh, come over here. I mean, I think principles just get sales pitch after sales pitch after sales pitch, and it can get really, really, really grinding. Um, I remember when I first started this in EdTech, um, I knew every company and could tell you like probably every founder. EdTech has just exploded, and there's like five startups a day because it's become such a hot thing. Um, like I've yelled at EdTech companies to stop calling me at a certain point because like, I'm like, you're not the product I want to use. Um, so it's hard, right? Like because like you're trying to sell. One, I think for school leaders and educators, they should get started. The EdSurge Tech Index is a really, really good um, start. Um, it's broken down by categories. Educators have reviews on there. Another similar site is Graphite. And I honestly go right now, though, like my most powerful um, tool is my network. And asking other people, does this work? Um, that's genuinely what it is. Like I can read all the reviews. Obviously, salespeople want to sell it to you. But if you talk to someone and say, this is what sucks about it, this is what's great about it, you're able to anticipate that. Um, and a lot of products are also now starting to use pilots. And we uh, have a pretty robust piloting system where they'll we'll use it for like six months with one classroom, usually like a, an early adopter, strong classroom management, strong planner. Um, to see if it will work. Because um, the other reality is, like, a program may be awesome for one school, and it may come to your school, and it just falls flat. And so it's because every school has its own needs. Cool. I have three quick thoughts here. So number one is that we need to increase the speed at, we, at which we iterate. At w in way too many classrooms, I, my own was sometimes guilty of this, and in way too many schools, we try new things only once a year, only over the summer. And for us to have the dramatic change we want to have and to have the classrooms of tomorrow, we need to build faster iteration cycles in our classrooms. We can't only try one, you know, things once a year. So we need to figure that out, but two pieces of advice that as we start to iterate faster. One is that uh, we need to start with a problem and not start with a tool or a technology. Mm -hmm. um, way too many times uh, schools have said, Smart boards are great. Let's get smart boards in our classrooms. I love smart boards, but you need to think about what is the problem that they're solving. Is the problem in your classroom one that a smart board can actually solve? So start with the problem, um, not the technology. And then the last piece is that we need to invest teachers and people who are going to be implementing the technology in the decisions about what we buy. So one of the things that you see way too often, and it's terrible, is someone who is so far removed from the classroom, someone at the superintendent level has something that they think makes sense, but when it actually comes down to the classroom, it doesn't make sense. So we need to uh, test things out in classrooms with teachers, get their feedback, get student feedback as well as we pick out solutions. Awesome. And Craig and Michelle, I'm going to steer the conversation um, back to those in the audience who may be interested in scratching their own itch and starting out on a new idea or venture. Um, from your experience in the classroom, what were the key experiences or skill sets or qualities, char characteristics that you developed that absolutely, without a doubt, played a role in the success of your company? And aside from obviously having the Rolodex of teachers, like what core abilities did you develop as a teacher in the classroom that serve you just as well as an entrepreneur leading a business and a team? 
think that both teaching and entrepreneurship is a lot about urgency. And I think that in my classroom, uh, you know, you just feel a tremendous sense of urgency because you have a room full of kids who are depending on you. And as an entrepreneur, I feel like I feel the same way, except just on a much larger scale. Like, common lit can't break. Uh, and so, because so many teachers are relying on it everywhere. Yeah, I think the most important thing is to realize you're currently, by teaching, constantly innovating in your classroom. And there's not just like a, an instant change when you become an entrepreneur. It's basically the exact same thing. And so you notice something doesn't work, you fix it the next day, you build systems and processes to help eliminate inefficiencies. You're already entrepreneurs if you teach. The only difference is the problem sometimes isn't as simple as academic achievement when you become an entrepreneur. There's a lot of companies that, that aim to do that and very few prove that they're efficient. Um, so whatever you choose to do, basically do it like you're teaching and you'll probably be pretty good at it. Awesome. And Yamily, I think it's apparent to everyone at this point that you've had a pretty unique background and you've overcome adversity several parts of your life and, and, and been an only in some instances. How has that shaped you as an entrepreneur? And I'm particularly curious about maybe some of the lowest points so far in your building of your business and how you've persevered and overcome them. Hmm, sure. Let's see. I think one advantage is I share the same background as a lot of the students that I work with. And so like one, one story that comes to mind is um, over the course of two days, we brought them to two tech companies and um, it's a group of like, I think it was like 15 black girls in this all white tech company. And afterwards, you know, we could have a real conversation to say, you know, although no, you didn't see anybody that there that looks like you, know that you belong, they invited me there, I could work there. Uh, so I think um, me having my background makes it easier for, for them to hear that message directly. Um, and I'd say uh, something I was thinking about is, I was like, man, I went from you know undergrad at MIT, then TFA, then starting this thing. Like, man, I can't catch a break. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but man, sometimes I think back, I'm like, I made it through teaching, I could do this, you know? And so um, it, it just, um, I'm thinking of some great analogy about, you know, like when you just go through things, it makes you stronger to, to, to get through to the next thing. And so, I mean, this is so tough. But uh, just thinking back to, uh, yeah, teaching and other challenging situations, I think it's, it's worthwhile to, to continue to persevere. Awesome. Um, I hope this has been a facilitation of empathy building between educators and entrepreneurs. And I want to take one last stab at it. Um, all of you entrepreneurs, former educators, or educator entrepreneurs, I like to consider myself one, um, if you were talking to someone in the audience right now, I don't know, I'm going to call anybody out, but who is just kind of on ed tech overload at this point. They're a little skeptical, da 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 What would you say in general about why they should continue to take conversations and talk to entrepreneurs? Why? Anybody want to take a stab at it? Yeah. I mean, if you don't think you should talk to entrepreneurs, maybe you shouldn't. You might be the best solution. <laughs> But I would say that a lot of teachers in Teach for America, they noticed it was better when they made something that worked and their life was better and they slept a little easier and the students were learning. I mean, you all have something that works and you rely on it and it solves problems for you. And if the problems or the solutions today don't solve those problems, then you shouldn't be looking at them. I mean, we've talked about that over and over and over. But if you think that one of these could, then you need to in invest in helping them see that so that they'll work for the next generation of teachers. So um, I'd like to think, just kind of step back a second and think about the reason we're all here, right? Uh, the, the mission, the reason we're all, we all joined Teach for America in the first place. You know, one day all children uh, reducing the uh, achievement gap. And if we want to, to realize that vision, it's going to take so many changes. It's going to take human capital changes and new school models and all these things. But one of the types of changes that, for me, the, the type that is most exciting for me is technology. And there's aspects of technology. Technology alone is not going to achieve Teach for America's mission. There's no way. 
But technology has the ability to scale, and it has the ability to grow quickly. Clever grew from zero schools to 50,000 schools in just three years. And no school network or new school idea can grow that quickly. That doesn't mean that technology is better, having a, a different impact, but that, that aspect of being able to build schools, spread virally, and change dramatically is, to me, a huge component of how we'll realize that vision. And so even if you've you know, uh, tried some tools that didn't work or you're tired of uh, you know, us sending you 5,000 emails every day. Um, certainly set limits and set bounds, but I do think that investing some of your time and your resources and experimenting with technology is a great way that you, and giving feedback and helping us build better tools is a great way that we can all help uh, realize that vision. Awesome. And as I invite people up to the mics to ask questions, again, this is a safe space. Please ask authentically, honestly, anything that you want to know. Um, we welcome you. There's some rock stars up here on stage, and I highly, highly recommend that you take advantage of this. Um, and while people are coming up, I just want to ask the same question I asked for the last group, which is in three words, how do you want to be remembered? Are you and your product or service remembered today? So we'll just go down the line, starting with Craig. David's trying to tell me something. <laughs> uh, I guess digital formative assessment, but not without the buzzwords. I, I really want to actually do the formative part. <laughs> that was like 10. All right, David, 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 David. I'm waiting for David to tell me. There you go. Gather act, grow. Gather act, grow. There, there you go. go. Teamwork makes the dream work. All right, next one. Common lit is free. <laughs> <laughs> Stem from dance. <laughs> Personalizing student needs. Technology that works. All righty. Take the first question on the right. Uh, so one trend that was like kind of surprising across all the presentations is I would say like the ask was a little bit soft, and uh, I, th I think we've like said that TFA is a pretty amazing network of people. Uh, so I was wondering if everybody down the line could give us like what would be your dream connection that could like be the next most important thing for you, like whether it's somebody a position you're looking to fill, an investor you want to meet with, a school director, district director, whatever it is. I'll start. Um, <laughs> we are looking for a school partner. We don't want to build our next feature set just like in our offices alone, disconnected from a school. So we are really looking for the right school or network partner um, that really wants to work with us for an entire year, do efficacy research with us, um, and just give us a natural test bed network so we can make something really good. For us, we're at a point where we just sort of, like I mentioned, figured out how to bring the two together and in a position to start to grow. And so uh, just looking for larger vehicles to um, spread so that instead of one conversation with one principal, it could be one conversation with you know a network head or district head who has um, access to more schools for that one conversation. I don't have a product, but um, an ask for Teach for America <laughs> overall and just education in general is recognizing that technology is becoming intertwined with curriculum. It's no longer IT and making sure that um, when there's a new NASH curriculum or when there's a new initiative, making sure that their theme is intertwined with curriculum uh, so that it can be done seamlessly together and not separate silos. Uh, my biggest ask is uh, diverse talent. Um, we're hiring. Come to our uh, happy hour at 4 at Bobby Vance. You get a flyer <laughs> if you want. Um, but we're, we have op opportunities for people who are stepping out of the classroom and looking to get into ed tech and also opportunities for senior leaders who have um, had lots of experiences. Yeah, I I'd like people to make bigger bets in their investments. Teach for America has only put like 600000 into the Social Entrepreneurship Project. It aligns itself in the world to like $25,000. Good luck making a startup succeed with $25,000. We also have this incredible venue um, that is just filled with amazing people who just sit in rooms, write some notes down, and leave. They're not really betting on these startups. And then there's foundations here that could completely, with the stroke of a pen, make any of these things a reality. Not that they need to. I think that that's maybe they've tried before and that doesn't always work. But it, it's pretty nice to see just bold bets. I saw an augmented reality startup just get $1.35 billion. I, don't, I mean, that's amazing. Google invested $700 million and they haven't even released anything. <laughs> Nuts. Imagine if that big of a bet was taken in education 
and that wasn't like that was just normal. That would be a, a, a green ask for me. All right, thank you. Next question. This question is for Yamari. Um, I am going to be teaching math, and so I really was inspired by your approach to incorporating dance and math. Um, have you ever considered expanding the program to include males or gender nonconforming children? Mm -hmm. Yes, I've considered it, and it's something that I would love to do in the future. Right now, we're focusing on on the on girls because personally, I did lead that well. My hope is to in the future expand to not just boys, but also other activities that could accomplish things similar to what mm -hmm. dance could do. Um, to sort of like stem from like a franchise and um, just invite, because the core of the idea is to take what is relevant to our students and use that as a way to bring them into this sort of foreign land. And I think there's things beyond dance that could do that, that could attract more students. So that's the aspiration a few years down the line. All right. Hey there. Thank you all so much. I'm an incoming core member in Houston, and I want you to overall ed entrepreneurship is trying to slowly move away and eliminate the use of paper. Either that's you know, writing, uh, books, I mean, books are going to be gone soon, we all know, um, print books that is. I know, that's very sad. Uh, but the, the, the question I have for all of you is, have you seen um, at entrepreneurship, do you feel that there's any loss of moving away from the use of uh, print paper and print media, both as far as consuming and also producing work for students? I'll jump in on this one. I mean, I think that technology is a big thing of efficiency in many ways. Like, I think Google Classrooms, Edmodo, all these LMSs have taken off because it's been so easy to turn things in. We talk about the paperless classroom a lot. Um, I'm a math teacher. I actually prefer my kids to write things down and show their work. Like, I actually like that more. Um, it's been interesting to see, like, even ebooks having taken off with a lot of our high school kids and also college students aren't really loving them as opposed to, um, like, actual being able to highlight and things like that. Maybe the technology will catch up. Um, I'm going to promote another product. Classic is doing some really cool things where it's like you're actually writing down and seeing in real time. Um, I don't think we'll see paper disappear anytime soon. I think part of it is it goes back again to Dan's point. Why are you using the technology? Is it just to have a paperless classroom? Or what is the actual root cause that you're solving? Is there a reason that you want to have faster, like performative, you want faster responses? Mm -hmm. Like that's a reason to go somewhat paperless, right? But if, if something is accomplished, I, mean, I think it's weird because I tell school sometimes, you should scale back your technology. It's just too much right now. You actually need, like, you're, you're doing technology for technology's sake. You did it because it's shiny, and that's not solving the problem. Right. I want to add just real quick. You can draw stuff on our side, too. Um, so if you want to do the drawing assessments, feel free to go to formative. Um, the students can annotate. But really for the, this question, I, I think it's just we're, we're right in the middle of something, and we're, we're going to look back at this era and that question is probably going to sound very different <laughs> when you're older. Um, iPads are like seven years old, and of course they're not good. I mean, they're just weird. They're awkward. They, they, they're clumsy to hold. But they were way better than anything before that. I mean, I don't, I've seen OLED technology that you could probably print actual pieces of paper that have digital information on them. So who knows what it's going to look like, but you got to not think about just today. Think about what it, it will be. I mean, it will probably even be tactile. It's going to be amazing. This will be fast, but I feel really strongly about this as a reading teacher. I believe that it is so important for children to have a physical copy of a book in their hand. Please do not take that away. We will have terrible, terrible outcomes. <laughs> All right. Getting into two. <laughs> yeah. All right, um, next one, and then a panelist, if you, we can pick like one or two of you guys to self select to answer the questions just because we're running out of time. Okay, next one. Uh, my name is Christian Newman. I was the core of 1991. We didn't really have computers. Yeah. So, uh, um, and I guess, uh, so uh, I've, I've actually started a number of businesses, and it's I wanted to sort of hear what, what's going on in the space, not educational related, but I guess my question is uh, what, what, are, what are the business models? in terms of getting the getting these things started and then how are you going to sustain them once they are started? I mean, who's paying you? I mean, is, is it even sustainable in the long run? Um, I'll jump in and then maybe Craig or 
Uh, well, someone else can jump after this. Uh, so for Clever, we have a sustainable business model. We charge applications that sell to schools um, on a per school per year basis, um, have great revenue, growing the team. Um, we and, and because of that, we can also see that there are lots of companies that are very sustainable, making uh, one of them is right there, ScribeSense, uh, who sell their products to principals or to districts and earn a great business. It's hard to grow quickly in education, but once you have sales, they're very sticky. I'll chime in just because we chose a very different business model. We're one of the few nonprofit ed tech companies, um, and we chose this very strategically against everybody's <laughs> recommendations <laughs> to us. But if we think about it, the most like successful ed tech company you'd probably think of Khan Academy, which is, you know, relies on philanthropy, um, and it is generative for other. Uh, it's just a great technology. It's generative for other innovation. Um, and for us, being a nonprofit at first uh, was really hard. Everybody said, you know, if you're giving away your stuff for free, how are you going to exist in 10 years? And um, we're, you know, at a point now where we're starting to generate revenue, but we were able to reach a hu huge scale really fast because we remove costs as a barrier to entry. Um, and so I would recommend it as a business model. All right, next question, and then you'll wrap this up. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Rushi uh, from Denver 08 Core. Uh, question for um, the entire, I guess, hopefully the startup side as well as the school side. In an earlier session about district spending, there didn't seem to be a lot of sophistication around evaluating return on investment for districts that do invest in technologies. And that lack of sophistication can't exist in perpetuity. So I'm curious, my question is, how are you shaping the conversation with districts about, hey, this is how you should evaluate whether we're effective, and like this is what you should hold us accountable to? While they're thinking, I'll just answer really quickly. So the US Department of Education is creating a new rapid cycle iteration model and plan that they're planning to roll out this year. So that's one way I think the powers that be will be infiltrating that. So I'm trying to, I had an initial response, but um, <laughs> Sorry. chain of thought got blown. But basically, I don't feel like any company has ever produced a really solid efficacy study. So anytime a principal or school district superintendent hears that, it's not usually reproducible because classrooms are not laboratories and you can't isolate the variables very well and say, if I just give this to this other teacher, it's going to work. So schools right now are actually buying things on other pain points other than efficacy because they just, I mean, efficacy sounds good, but it's not really valid yet. It would be wonderful if you could actually have something that you could copy and paste and it would work. But right now, I don't know if that's the reality. So a lot of times what you have to sell to an administrator is something that actually solves their problem reliably and comfortably, and a lot of times they look for recommendations from others and peers, and I think you've heard that. I, I was just gonna say, we're starting to scratch the surface on that right now. I think one small thing is, are people even using the product? I think the sad thing is we'll buy lots of product and it just sits there. So these are like tens of thousands of dollars, if not millions of dollars in larger districts, where it's just not being used. It's the equivalent of textbooks just sitting in a storage room. Mm -hmm. um, and so like a small thing is clever will let us like click, track the clicks. Like part of my job is to look, are teachers using this product? at the very, very minimum, and our students spending time on it. Um, companies are giving the recommendations of what they're doing, but we're starting to run analyses, trying to find correlations to see like, um, like, so like if this classroom used it. I think uh, to Craig's point, sometimes a good teacher is just a good teacher. It doesn't matter what tools they have, and a bad teacher is struggling right now, and this tool's not gonna solve it. So I think that variable makes it really, really hard to parse down, is it this tool, or is it this teacher, or is it this, like, you know, like, the kids all had a good day and they tested really well that day. I think that part we're still, tr there's a lot of noise um, that makes it really hard for statistics. We are trying to partner with more colleges. Harvard, uh, Professor Kane um, is starting a new initiative um, and they're doing with ST Math and Lexia, trying to answer that exact question with a partnership with schools. I think also part of the problem, just real quick, part of the problem is that efficacy research studies are just prohibitively expensive for startups. Um, I think that we need to just, it's like millions of dollars. It's just, you know, it's just not in the cards for a lot of startups. So to have a school that says like, oh, well, did you do a standard, you know, randomized control trial study? 
uh, like no, but I can show you, you know, small scale results. So I think in the long run, um, people, groups who are doing efficacy research need to make it accessible. All right, last question. Sure, uh, Chris Maloney, 1990. I noticed, this my question is for four minutes. I'll call you Mr. Four minutes. Uh, because I, I'm sorry I came in late, I didn't catch your name. <laughs> but uh, the question is about clickers. You don't use clickers, uh, looks like any device. I was interested in that claim. And uh, I've got some old Dell laptops from 10 years ago. I'm a community college instructor now. So um, I guess, uh, is, is that really right? I think any device, it's dangerous to say that to somebody my age. So yeah. as Chris I mean, if it's a modern web device okay. that yeah. has just a browser like Chrome, old it's going to work. Okay. Lo old laptops can work. We have teachers who use really old laptops, but okay. it, a lot of times the browser is the only thing that really matters in that sense. Do, you, is, do, do your students, the students in the schools you serve, have access issues any serious access issues uh, that you know of? They all have, they all come, I know most of my students come with smartphones, but some don't. Yeah, we've made it web-based and it works great on your phone. I mean, okay. if they have a, a smartphone for sure, it should, yeah. should work. Okay. It definitely beats clickers. Yeah. And they're, it's, I said it's free for teachers, by the way. I don't think I said that, so I um, <laughs> probably should have mentioned that earlier. <laughs> <laughs> so definitely take a look sure. and, and plus email us and we'll help you. All right. Um, I just want to wrap up really quickly and make sure we ground this conversation in this momentous event we're at, right? It's the 25th anniversary of Teach for America. And as I showed you guys on that initial slide, right, the whole charge was about creating leaders who are going to advance educational equity. Seven years ago, Teach for America took a step further and said, we're specifically going to support entrepreneurs who are willing to take a stab at this as well. And so I just want to remind us, because we were talking a lot about the problems and the, and the lack of uh, succinct overlap at this point, but just remember we're in our infancy. We're going to need really, really visionary entrepreneurs who are willing to put their neck out to build new innovation. But we're going to need school leaders, I'm looking at you, who are going to take a bet, a bet and a big bet to purchase some of these solutions. And we're going to need all of you teachers to give it a go and try it and give that feedback. But it starts with you guys showing up here, and I don't want to discount how important and historic this room right now is because we're setting up Teach for America to be on a whole different level for leveraging entrepreneurship specifically to go after this problem. So again, I hope you guys feel inspired, uplifted, a little bit more empathy from both sides of the table. But we're going to wrap up here, and the last thing I would just want to remind you is Teach for America has a program. It's called Social Entrepreneurship and Innovation. They have a full-fledged team that is willing to help you work on your ideas, willing to help you as educators interested in implementing this technology. Don't be afraid to utilize them. Um, there's a website, email, Twitter. If you guys had a great time, make sure you give them a shout out online. Thanks again to Naya and Vinit, one of the founding members of the team as well, who's here. If you guys could stand up, we can give you guys a round of applause. <laughs> so I will let the entrepreneurs go um, and one more huge round of applause for them, you guys. <laughs>